Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to Spanish and English speaking people. And every week on the cloudchurch.org, I post a new sermon in English and Spanish, as well as a uh, midweek service as we're going right now, verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written. And we are actually in Romans right now, going verse by verse, which is a lot of fun. But this week, um, I've been praying a lot and, and trying to figure out what do I preach. And I had a, a certain thing planned that I wanted to preach on for this week. And by the way, it is uh, January of 2016. And I said, well, maybe I should preach on this. And then all of a sudden, the Lord laid something on my heart. And wouldn't you know it, uh, I got a couple phone calls, a couple emails of people asking, can you please show us about how to lead someone to Jesus Christ? And so it was like, okay, well that's confirmation because that was the very thing that the Lord was laying on my heart to preach on. And the topic, of course, will be how to lead a soul to Jesus Christ. I've got a lot of, of, of emails and, and phone calls from people thanking me for preaching the gospel through this medium. And uh, lots of people have said that they've gotten saved through these videos. It's been a little over a year now that I've been preaching these videos online. And um, I would say we probably get an average of a, a good two, three people a month, at the very least, who have contacted us and told us we've gotten saved through your preaching of the gospel through YouTube. So I just thank the Lord. It's not about me. It's not about bragging about me and what I'm doing. It's bragging on the Lord and what He's doing as we see people get saved through this ministry. And because of that, a lot of people who've gotten saved have said, well now what do I do? Now that I'm a Christian, how do I go and tell someone else how to be saved? And so that's what this message is about. It's for people who've recently gotten saved, how to go win others to Jesus Christ. But it's also for people who've been saved for years, how they can as well go tell people about how to be saved. So we're going to get started on this message and I hope it's a blessing to you and a help to you. So I pray that you'll take heed to this message and begin to use what, uh, what I'm about to present today in the hopes of going out and winning people to Jesus Christ so that they too can be saved. It's so important, so important to win souls to Jesus Christ. Now with that stated, unfortunately, there are some people out there that, that brag upon themselves about being soul winners and they claim they, they win three or four people a day to the Lord. Is that true? We're going to look at that a little bit today because there are some people that totally pervert how to win a soul to Jesus Christ. And what they do is they try to pressure somebody to do something. And what they do inadvertently, whether they know it or not, is leaving a person thinking they're saved because something they did rather than trusting fully and completely upon what Jesus Christ did for them. So when we go to win a soul, we have to make sure that we're not trying to give a person a work and tell them, do this work and you can be saved, because we're not saved by works. We need to make sure when we go to witness to people, we are pointing them to Jesus Christ alone, to Christ Jesus who suffered and bled and died on the cross, and that they're looking toward Him, and that they're saying, wow, he is the way of salvation. I'm saved by Christ and by Christ alone and not by my works. So it's so important to do this. So I'm, I want to start in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, we have a man named Philip, verse 30. And in verse 29, the Holy Spirit of God told Philip, Go to this one guy and talk to him about the Lord. And he begins to talk to this man in verse 30, Acts chapter 8 and verse 30, and Philip says, Understandeth thou what thou readest? And verse 31, the man, an Ethiopian eunuch, says, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, He was as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. So he said, How can I, except some man guide me? Well, we're supposed to lead souls to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means we guide them through the scriptures and we show them the verses on salvation and how to be saved. Well, today, there's a lot of people that say, well, that's easy, just the Romans Road. Is the Romans Road? You see, the Romans Road has been whittled down to maybe two or three or four verses at the most. And a lot of times when people get through with their little spiel of those three or four verses, then they say, now repeat this prayer after me. And oftentimes a person is led to pray a prayer, and then the soul winner says, now you're saved because you prayed. But does the prayer save? 
there's a man who was a famous evangelist named John R. Rice. And John R. Rice said these words, Many believe that a sinner cannot be saved without a period of prayer, without consciously calling upon God. However, the Bible does not say that a sinner must pray in order to be saved. In fact, immediately following the verse in Romans 10.13, which is, by the way, where Romans ends up. The so-called Romans road today takes you to Romans 10.13. It says, see there? That's how you get saved. It says, it says uh, Romans 10.13 is an explanation which shows that calling on God is an evidence of faith in the heart, and that is really faith which settles the matter. No matter how long he prays, if he does not trust in Christ, he can never be saved. If he trusts Christ without conscious prayer, then he is saved already. There is just one plan of salvation, and just one step a sinner must take to secure it. That step is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So today, modern soul winners, many of them in many churches around the world, tell a person, you want to get saved? Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So just call on the Lord with your, name, uh, with your mouth and say, oh God, save me. Well, this guy, this famous evangelist, says, no, it's believing from the heart that saves. Let me give you an illustration. One time, while I was in Bible school, every Thursday night, we went out and knocked on doors and with a partner. And we went out and we did what we call soul winning. We tried to win souls to Jesus Christ. Well, my partner <clears throat> used the Romans Road, one, two, three, repeat after me method. And we go to this house, and there's this guy there, and he opens the door. And I'll never forget, he opens the door, and his hand's behind the door. And I'm thinking, what has he got in his hand? He's not showing us what's in his hand. I'm thinking, has he got a gun or something? And so my partner says, well, I'd like to share these verses with you and see you get saved. And the Bible says, and the guy goes, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, his hand's still behind the door. Yeah, yeah, get on with it. Get on with it. Hurry up, hurry up. And so he read all these verses, and he says, now would you like to be saved? And the man said, if, if that's what you want, fine. Just, just tell me the prayer, and I'll repeat it. And so my partner says, well, okay, Lord, I'm a sinner, please save me, amen. I'm a sinner, please save me, amen. The man repeated it. And then he says, well, amen, you're saved. And he goes, yeah, I'm saved. And then he pulls his hand out from behind the door, and there was a beer. And he says, now, if you excuse me, I've got a party to get back to. Slam! And slam the door. <laughs> now, did that guy get saved? Well, a lot of modern-day soul winners think that the prayer saves, and if you can just show a guy a couple of verses and make him repeat a prayer, then there's another soul won to Jesus. Well, what was that guy doing? That guy had probably dealt with a lot of people because that neighborhood, this church that I was part of, went to a lot. So I'm sure that wasn't the first time that someone had knocked on his door. And he realized, hey, if they'll just repeat a prayer, then they'll leave me alone. So the sooner I can get them to let me pray a prayer, the sooner they'll leave, and I can slam the door and go back to drinking my beer. So that guy did not get saved. He said something with the mouth, but he didn't believe it in the heart. Let me give you another illustration. This is sad. But uh, modern Christianity today, that's what they think. They think the prayer saves. So the sooner you get them to pray, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the sooner you get them to pray, the sooner they'll get saved. Not necessarily. They could be just saying something with the lips in order to get rid of you because they don't want to be there and not believing it from the heart. I was in, uh, I believe it was Rhode Island years ago with another pastor and we went to a uh, filling station and we looked at this uh, filling station. I began to witness to this clerk behind the counter at the filling station and he told me, oh, I believe in Jesus. And I said, oh, really, really? Are you a Christian? And he says, no. I said, then you believe in Jesus, but you're not a Christian. He goes, no, I'm a Muslim. I said, oh, well, explain that, please. And he says, well, Muslims believe in Jesus. They believe he's a prophet, and we believe Jesus was a prophet. Well, I found out later, as you read through uh, the Muslims' works and everything, they believe that Jesus was a prophet and that he went to heaven, but they teach that he's going to come back someday and apologize to the world for lying to the world. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches, but that's what Islam believes. Well, I talked to this guy and was witnessing to him. He says, look, I want you to come to my mosque and talk to my imam, my teacher. And so I said, well, okay, I'd be happy to do that. And he gave me the address. Well, I did not want to go to, alone, you know. So I asked the pastor, would you go with me to this mosque? So I went around and, and we came into this mosque and they were waiting for us. And this imam says, I'm going to give you a tour of the mosque. And he began to show us all these things and tell us about what he believed. And as he's showing us around, he's telling us about all these conversions to Islam that took place in just the last couple of weeks at his mosque. And I said, okay, tell me about that. He says, well, we had to, he, he called them white people. He said, we had two white people come, and I showed them around just as I'm showing you around, and they confessed 
salvation through Allah and trusted Allah. I said, oh, okay, tell me about that. And then he said, well, before that, a week or two ago, we had two or three uh, Europeans that came, and they too converted to Islam. And I said, so tell me, how does a person convert to Islam? And he says, I'll, I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. And he began, and, and I'm thinking, what is this guy doing? He wants to show me his mosque, he wants to tell me about his religion, and he's telling me about all these people that have converted to his, his religion. What, what is this guy doing? And the whole time he's giving us this tour and he's talking, he keeps saying, all is God, all is God. Just remember, all is God. And so when we get to the, to the, to the door, after he showed us everything, he says, now, all I would ask of you is to say that Allah is God. And I said, well, I've studied who Allah really is, and that's something that I can't say. When I said that, the man got angry. He said, say Allah is God. I said, I, I just can't say it. Say Allah is God. And he kept getting angrier and mad. And I said, sir, wait a minute. How does a person become a convert to Islam? He says, they say Allah is God. I said, so you want me to say Allah is God, and then you will count me as a convert to your religion? He says, that's exactly right. Now say it, say it, say it. He was pressuring me to say something that I did not believe. You know what's sad? That's modern Christianity today as well. Many people within modern Christianity today, they go to a sinner and they say, say this prayer, repeat this prayer. Oh Jesus, I believe in you. Oh, repeat it, repeat it. And they pressure a sinner to say something that they don't believe. Many times there's been lost people that will repeat what they call the sinner's prayer, but they only did it with the mouth, but they never believed it from the heart. Sure, in that mosque I could have said, all is God, just to make that guy happy, but I didn't believe it. So he might have counted me as a convert, but I know in my heart I wasn't. Well, that happens in modern Christianity today. Soul wonders want people to get saved more than the people themselves. So they tell them, repeat this prayer, repeat this prayer, repeat this prayer. And then a person does it. They say, see, now you're saved. And the person goes away going, I never believed that. I just said it so he'd leave me alone. It's like that guy with the beer with his hand behind the door. If you'll just tell me to pray the prayer, I'll pray it. Then you can go and leave me alone. So what you have to understand is this. Go to Matthew chapter 13. And it's sad because very few people today who claim to be soul winners understand this. That salvation is from the heart, believing Sure, you can say something with the mouth, but when I try to win souls to, to Jesus, when I tell people how to be saved, I do not pressure them and say, Now pray this prayer with me or else! What I do is I take them to the scriptures and I say, Now, it's up to you. Do you trust Jesus? Do you want Him as your Savior? I want them to believe from the heart, not just repeat something from the lips. Because all that does is make a false convert. And oftentimes you have preachers going around telling people, well, did you say the prayer? Yeah, then you're saved. And so the person believes, well, I'm saved because he said so. That's not how you win a soul. The way you're saved is by believing the Word of God and because the Word of God says so. I would never want to deceive a soul into thinking they're saved because I told them they were saved. I want them to understand the gospel and be saved and know they're saved, not because I say so, but because the Bible says so. So Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says this. Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. It says, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, or Isaiah which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Verse 15, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now did you get that? Understand with their heart. There must be some understanding before a person can get saved. So what the goal is of trying to lead a soul to Jesus Christ is to take them through the scriptures so that they come to a point of understanding. What do they need to understand? They need to understand the gospel. You know, the Romans road doesn't present the gospel very clearly. Just reading someone a couple of verses and then saying, now repeat this prayer, oftentimes leads to a person thinking, oh, well then the prayer saves me, so if I repeat the prayer, then I'm saved. This leads to a person doing what they call the sinner's prayer every night before they go to bed. And sometimes two or three times a day. That's what happened to me. When I was a child, people told me, well, just ask Jesus in your heart, pray the prayer. 
Every night between the age of 13 to 18 years old, I prayed the sinner's prayer over and over. Oh, God, please save me. Oh, God, please save me. I don't want to go to hell. Oh, God, please save me. What was the problem? I had no understanding of the gospel. I thought the prayer saved, so that's why I kept repeating the prayer, hoping, well, it didn't save then, so hopefully if I say it today, maybe it'll save me. I lacked understanding of the gospel. It wasn't until I was 18 years old that my father took me through the scriptures and guided me and showed me the verses, and that's the first time in my life that I can ever remember, and I've been in church every day of my life as a child, that I can ever remember hearing the gospel of salvation, and that's when I understood it. So for a person to be saved, there must be some understanding there. That person needs to understand the gospel. And that's the sad, sad thing today. Modern Christianity, they try to, to make it into this quick presentation of, here, you're a sinner, the Bible says this, this, this. Now, repeat this prayer. And, and a person has no understanding. Are they trusting in Christ? Or are they trusting in the prayer? Sadly, often they trust in the prayer rather than trusting in in Jesus Christ shed blood and the gospel. So what I want to do today, I'm going to take you to the scriptures and show you how to lead a soul to Jesus Christ. Ha show them how to be saved. Now we must remember, everyone has free will. So they may accept it or they may reject, reject it. We are only responsible for teaching them what the Bible says. You know, a lot of people who claim to be soul winners, they want a person to get saved more than the person wants to get saved. And so they pressure them to repeat a prayer. You know, it's easy to get a person to repeat a prayer. I mean, it's super easy, <laughs> especially with children. You tell a child, repeat this prayer, they go, okay, blah, blah, blah. and then you tell them, oh, now you're saved. Well, that child, what if he never understood the gospel? Well, then what you've done is caused more damage and more harm than good because from an early age, that person will think they're a Christian, and it won't take, it'll take a long time till later they realize they were lost. So you've deceived them into thinking they were saved. Now, that's not to say that a, uh, a person can't be saved as a child. I'm sure they can, but the only way to be saved, according to the Bible, is understand the gospel and believe the gospel. And my testimony is like a lot of people's testimonies. As a child, I repeated a prayer. And I thought I was saved because I was told that's what saves you. And so my whole life I was deceived in thinking I was saved by something I did by repeating a prayer. And like I said, it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I understood. Oh, all these years I've been trusting in what I did. Now I trust in what Jesus did for me. And that's when I got saved. So I hope this message will, will help you. Now look at what uh, Peter, uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says these words. At verse 1 through 5, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Well, evangelist, what does that mean? It means to go to evangelize. And that's what we're supposed to do, is to evangelize sinners. How do we do it? We have to guide them, lead them in the scriptures, and show them until they come to the understanding of the gospel so that they can believe it and be saved. So I'm going to read a bunch of verses today, and I hope you have a piece of paper and a pencil and you can write this down. Because if you're a Christian and you want to learn to lead souls to Jesus Christ, these are just some of the many verses that you can use. And you know, you don't have to use the same verses every time when you try to deal with a sinner. So that's why I'm going to give you a bunch of different verses. And when you deal with someone, everybody's different. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know how much understanding they have or don't have. So the Holy Spirit of God might put in your head a verse that they need to hear. So you don't have to use the Romans road, well, I can only give them these four verses and nothing else. No, you can give them any verse from the Bible that might be what they need to hear at that time, as long as it leads them to a saving knowledge of the truth by trusting the gospel. And they must understand before they can believe. So first of all is the sin issue. In order to get saved, a person needs to realize that they're a sinner. You can't get saved unless you realize you're a sinner. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write up here Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. I'm just going to write a couple of verses up here. 
And we're going to look at those, and these are good verses to show someone that they're a sinner. Now, you may or may not believe that you're a sinner if you're lost. Could be a lost person's watching this. Well, then you can't be saved. You say, what? Jesus Christ came to save sinners. <laughs> he didn't come to save people that don't believe they're sinners. So if you don't believe you're a sinner, then you say, I'm not a sinner. Then, sorry, Jesus didn't die for you. You see how important it is? A person needs to realize they're a sinner. And I have come across many people that say, I'm not a sinner. Uh, well, let's, let's go to the Bible and look at that. Because the Bible says that you are. And you can't be saved until you realize that you're a sinner. So, basically, let's just look at these verses. I'm going to read them. You can write them down. It would be nice if you memorized these verses. And they're verses you can use. Now, most people in the world today know they're sinners. Many do. But sadly, we live in a day and age of, of a lot of, of ignorant people. I hate to say it that way, but there's been a dumbing down in America where they don't teach. They teach this math where 2 plus 2 is 5, which is ridiculous. So there's some people in the world, and as the world continues, there'll be a lot more, that don't even know what sin is. So you've got to deal with the sin issue before you can lead someone to the Lord. So you've got to show them what sin is. Show, sin is disobedience. Sin is doing wrong. Uh, Romans 10, uh, 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. So if a person says, well, I'm not a sinner, you say, well, what does all mean? Does that mean everybody, you included? Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So all are sinners. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, sin... And because you're a sinner, you're going to die. Well, what happens when you die? That's a good time to deal with hell. And some people know they're dying and going to hell. Other people don't. So you might need to show some verses about hell. You might not. What you have to get into your head is, how can I give this person scriptures to where they come to the right understanding of the gospel? You see, you don't know. Well, one guy said, one man's head is another world. Every man's head is a different world. Uh, you don't know what a person is thinking. So the best thing to do when you're trying to win someone to Jesus Christ is get an idea of who are they, where do they come from, what do they believe. Now, I want them to get on the same page as God in the Bible, so I need them to understand, and that's key to salvation, is understanding. First thing they need to understand is they're going to die someday because they're a sinner. And these verses in the Bible show that they're a sinner. John chapter 7, verse 7 is a good verse that talks about uh, sin. The whole world, I believe, it says, life and wickedness. Or am I thinking of another verse? Another verse. John chapter 7 and verse 7 is a good verse. So people have to understand that they're sinners. The world cannot hate you, but, it hateth, but me it hateth, because I testified of it that the works thereof are evil. So the world is evil, and the works of the world are evil. What does that mean? There's sin in the world. And before a person can be saved, they have to see themselves as a sinner. And they have to understand that because of sin, we're all going to die someday. When you die, where do you go? Well, one of two places, either heaven or hell. Now, what if you come across a person that says, well, I'm not a sinner. <clears throat> well, I usually take them to 1 John 1, 8 and Romans 3, 4. Just write those down and look them up. But those are good verses. If a person says, well, I'm not a sinner, I've never sinned. Those verses prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If someone says they're not a sinner, they deceive themselves. So they need to see the sin issue first. Next, they need to see the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now before I write down these verses, let me say, as I have written down here in my notes, a man will never get saved until he first realizes he is lost. You know, for many years, I used to go around and ask people, Hey, are you saved? Are you saved? Hey, when did you get saved? And, you know what, I, I realized, you know, you know what's better to ask a person, rather than, are you saved? Is, hey, when was the first time you realized you were lost? <laughs> because lately, I've come across a lot of people say, Hey, man, are you saved? They go, oh, sure. And you say, well, when did you get saved? Oh, I've always been saved. I was born saved. I don't know if you've ever heard that from someone, but I've heard that from sinners a lot. Oh, I've always been saved. 
No, it doesn't work that way. There has to be a time in your life when you realize you are a sinner and you realize you are lost and damned to hell. And that's when you came to Jesus Christ through the gospel. So it's not when did you get saved, because some people think, well, I got saved when I was born. It's when did you get lost. So let me write some verses up here and we'll look at these. These are verses on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And what you need to do is show them that Jesus died on the cross in the, their place for their sins. You see, Jesus died for sinners. If a person doesn't believe that they're a sinner, then how can they get saved? They won't trust Jesus Christ because they don't believe he died for them because they'll say, well, I'm not a sinner. You see how that works? So, it's so important. Whoops, First Peter... So important that a person understands, first of all, that they're a sinner. I wanted to put another verse over here. I'll put it over on the side, I guess. So I'm running out of space here. So let's run through these verses. These are good verses to show people about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So here we go. Uh, first is 1 Timothy 1.15. And like I said, you don't have to use the Romans road, which is just a couple of verses. Because I believe that oftentimes the Roman road... The Romans road doesn't give enough information. It's just four verses. You think a person can get saved in just a couple of verses? Well, it's possible if a person has heard the gospel before that, and the seed has been planted before. But quite often, the seed has never been planted, and a person shows up with the Romans road, and they think the person understands everything. Well, what if a person doesn't? You see, the Bible says that the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And the thing, the problem I have with the Romans Road is it never goes to this passage. The Romans Road says, oh, you're a sinner, Jesus died in your place, now repeat this prayer after me. Why don't they say, hey, now that we went through the Romans Road, let's go to the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. <laughs> I don't understand why the people that use the Romans Road don't go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. That's the most important verse because that's the Gospel. Now, I've given that many times. If you have a short purse time to deal with somebody then that's the first place you should take them, is the way I think, rather than going to the Romans road, because here it says Christ died for our sins. Well, that deals with the sin, and that deals with the sacrifice. So that's a good passage to take someone, and it says you're saved by believing in this. So the Romans road, yeah, if you want to use that, help yourself, but I don't think it's enough information. I think that this is the best passage of Scripture to go to. So I always take time when I deal with someone. Now, the problem with many people in the world today is they're religious already. And so the question is, well, how long does it take to win somebody to Jesus Christ? Well, some people think, well, all I do is read them four verses from the Romans Road and tell them to repeat after me, and they're saved. Well, how do you know that there's understanding of just reading four verses? You see, the problem with many people today is, like I said, they're religious, so they've been indoctrinated in a false religion telling them all these certain things. And when it comes to winning the soul today, it's almost like you have to go through a deprogramming session and show them what they have been taught is wrong before you can get to this point to show them what the Bible teaches. For example, you come to a Catholic. Well, they've been taught that the church saves, that the Pope is the only one that tells the truth, and what he says supersedes the Bible, and he can speak ex cathedra, and that they have to go to a priest, when the Bible says a priest can never take away your sins, and they have to be baptized as a child, and all these things that aren't in the Bible. So before they'll believe the truth, it's almost like you have to go through a deprogramming session and say, okay, these are all the things that your religion teaches, look at what the Bible says about that. Now that you understand that your religion is teaching you a lie, now look at the truth. <laughs> so I think that to win a soul to Jesus Christ, I don't see how you can lead a soul to Jesus in less than about 30 minutes. Because you've got to sit down, you've got to talk with them, you've got to understand where they're coming from. What is it that they believe? What if they've already been, been, been taught and indoctrinated by false belie belief and a false religion into believing something that's wrong? And what you need to do is show them, look, that's wrong because the Bible says this. Now this is right. So it, it takes time to win somebody to Jesus Christ. One time I was in a church, and I'll get back to this in a minute, but one time I was in a church in Arkansas, and it was a missions conference, and they called all these missionaries to come, and they said, uh, well, hey, come over here to this missions conference for a whole week. And there was 50, 60, 70 missionaries at this huge, big church in Arkansas. 
And we were there, and they gave out these papers and said, this is what we're going to do this week, and we're going to play golf on this day, we're going to do this and go to the mall on this day, and all these things. And I looked, and I was like, what about trying to win souls to Jesus Christ? So what I did is I went to the pastor, and I said, Pastor, this is a, a missions conference, and missions is about going to win souls. I said, how come there's no soul winning here in this church for this week? You've got a ton of missionaries here. Why not send them out? door to door, knocking on doors to win souls to Jesus Christ. And the pastor says, well, I hadn't thought about that. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, well, that should have been... Anyway, that's what the mission of the church is, try to win souls. Well, we went out, and before we did, the pastor said, anybody that wins a soul to Jesus Christ, we will take them on for support, right, on the spot. And I was like, oh, boy. So you say, you're basically saying, if you win someone to Jesus, I'll give you money. Well, that's not the reason that we win souls. It's not so we get something out of it. It's because we love Jesus Christ. So I had a bit of a problem with that. Well, I went with another brother that came from the same Bible school as me. And uh, we went out, and we were preaching on the street. And we were going door to door knocking to people. And then these two guys come up. And for the next 45 minutes, my partner there, my soul winning partner, took these two black guys through the Bible and showed them what the Bible says about salvation. He showed them their sin. He showed them the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the bloody Christ dying in their place for their sins. And these two guys, literally tears running down their face. And he led those two guys to the Lord. He didn't say, now repeat this prayer. He said, now do you want to be saved? He says, now here's how you get saved. And those two boys says, well we we're sorry that we killed Jesus Christ. We trust Him as our Savior. Right now, by faith, Jesus, we trust in You and accept You as our Savior. And He prayed for those boys, and those boys walked away born again. New creatures in Christ. When we got done, it was an hour that the pastor said, you can go out and win souls. Well, we got done, and as soon as we did, this other missionary came. And he was going to all the other missionaries. He goes, well, how many did you win to the Lord? How many did you win to the Lord? And, and, and they said, well, we didn't in, win anybody today. He goes, well, I won three people. Woohoo! And he goes, how many of you? Well, you didn't. I, I won three people. And I looked at him and said, man, he's bragging on himself. And then he comes over and he talks to us. And he says, how many did you win to the Lord? And my uh, friend, he was actually a friend of mine, this missionary says, brother, I led two people to the Lord today, to Jesus Christ. He said it took a little while, but they were crying and in tears. And they were so thankful to hear the gospel and to get saved. Now you would think a man who's a missionary who loves God would say, praise God. No. This so-called missionary says, well, so what? I won three more than you. Ha ha. And walked away. And I just looked at my, my brother and he looked at me and it was like, who is that and what is that? You see, winning a soul to Jesus Christ isn't so that we can brag about ourselves. It's bragging about Jesus. He's the winner. <laughs> We're just the leader. We lead them to Christ, and he's the one that actually wins them. They say, well, he that wins will souls is wise. Okay, I understand that, but we point them to Christ. We don't point them to us. We don't brag about ourselves. So I went up to that missionary and said, how did you uh, win these people to the Lord? He goes, well, I just showed them four verses and said, repeat after me, and they repeated after me. And I just hung my head and said, man, that's sad. How do you know they got saved? Well, you might say, well, how do you know they didn't? I don't know. They could have gotten saved. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. But I've been in this a long time. I've been winning souls to the Lord. I've been preaching on the street. I've been in the ministry. I've started churches. I've seen people like that. And all they've been taught is force a person to repeat after you. So I don't believe that guy led anybody to the Lord. I believe what he did was show them a couple verses and then say, now repeat after me. But you know what? They probably repeated after him because they wanted to get rid of him, just like that guy with his hand behind the door with the beer. So what you have to get is, what is a soul winner? A soul winner is someone that leads a soul to Christ by guiding them through the scriptures and trying the best that he can to make sure that that soul understands that salvation is through faith in the gospel. Guys like Mr. I won three to the Lord, they don't care about the understanding. All they want is to get them to repeat that prayer so they can go right around and brag about it. I got three people to repeat a prayer. But how do you know they believe from the heart? You don't. All you know is you've got three people to repeat something after you. And you're no better than Mr. Muslim 
who was trying to get people to say that Allah is God. So it's all about the understanding from the heart, as we read in Matthew when we began. And there's got to be that understanding. Well, when my guy talked, my, my partner talked to those two black guys, and they were literally crying, you know what my thought was? Wow. If they're shedding tears, then there must have been some understanding in their heart. But when the guy goes, yeah, yeah, in less than an hour, I've got three people to repeat a prayer, that makes me wonder, well, where's, where's the understanding? Were they crying? Were, were they... No, all you did was get them to repeat a prayer. And so that's a problem in Christianity today. We have a lot of people that claim to be soul winners, but all they're interested in is, is getting a person to do something outwardly with their lips. You know what Jesus said? Let me read you this verse. He said, the problem with the Pharisees is, they don't care. They'll say everything right with the mouth, but their heart, they don't trust me. Matthew 15, 8, God speaks to those, and he says, They draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So if you want to be a good soul winner, you've got to realize, okay, for me to try to win a soul to Jesus Christ, the emphasis must be on Christ and that that soul understands what Jesus did for them. I'm not trying to push a person to say something with the lips. I'm trying to explain to a person so that that person will understand from the heart and become a true convert of Jesus Christ. Now what about these people that say something with the mouth but don't believe it in their hearts? Well, there's a lot of people that have been coaxed by a soul winner to repeat a prayer. And as soon as they do that, then the soul winner says, well, you're saved because you said the prayer. And that person goes away saying, well, I'm saved because he said so, so it must be true because he said so. And they go out and get drunk, they fornicate, they live like the devil. And you come to the door and knock on the door and say, hey man, you want to get saved? They go, oh no, I'm already saved. This guy told me years ago when I repeated a prayer that I'm saved. And so what is that person's faith and trust in? In the soul winner. And they say, well, he said I'm saved, so I must be saved. But there's no change in their life. They're not going to church. What happened? They made a convert with the lips but not the heart. So you have a person who's deceived, thinking they're a Christian, when they're lost and on their way to hell. Because there was no understanding and no faith in the gospel. So what were they trusting in? The prayer and in the soul winner. Well, a good soul winner is someone who goes with the scriptures and says, this is what you need to believe in and why. And a true convert is someone over here that says, I trust Christ, shed blood, because the Bible says so. Not because the soul winner says so, because the Bible... I hope you can see the difference. We have a bunch of soul winners out there who truly present the gospel clearly. And then we have what I call a bunch of soul wieners, a bunch of wieners, who are going out there talking about Jesus, giving them lip service, but all they want is to see a person repeat a prayer so they can write it in their Bible and brag about it. You know what I've seen personally? And this is sick. There's lots of people that like to go out and say, I'm a soul winner, I'm a soul winner, I'm a soul winner. And they say, once I get a person to repeat a prayer, I'll write it in my Bible. I have literally seen Bibles of people like that. And I've gone down the list of the names, and the same name is repeated two or three times. <laughs> what have they did? Well, what have they done? Well, what they did was they made a person think, the prayer saves me. And so the person saves the prayer, but then later they're like, well, I don't feel saved. I don't think I'm saved. I mean, he said I was, but I doubt it. So, oh, you know what? If he comes again, I'll pray the prayer with him all over again. And they do. And then they do it again. And they think it's the prayer that saves, but they have no assurance of salvation. They're not saved because they're trusting in a prayer rather than trusting in Christ, the propitiation. So that's why it's so important if you want to lead a soul to Jesus Christ that you point them to the Scriptures. That's why the more Scriptures, the better. So let's go through these Scriptures quickly on sacrifice. 1 Timothy 1.15 it says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And maybe I don't have time to read all of these, but... What you need to do is you need to show them what the Bible says because we want a person's faith to be in the Scriptures. We want them to trust what God said, not what we say. First Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5.21. What does the Bible say? 
For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. So Jesus died in our place for our sins. That's what it's saying. 1 Peter 3.18 1 Peter 3.18, what does that say? That's a good verse. That, that actually is the entire gospel in one verse of the Bible. It contains the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 18, it says, For Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The just for the unjust. Who's the just? Christ. Who's the unjust? Us sinners. You see, a sinner to be saved must realize, I'm the guilty one, and yet the innocent Christ died in my place for my sins. That's what you're trying to get them to understand. So that they can see, oh, he died for me. Oh, I can die for my own sins and burn in hell and pay for all eternity, which doesn't sound good. I don't think I like that option. Or I can take someone who died in my place for my sins and trust him as my Savior and go to heaven. Many so-called soul winners today, they don't care if a person understands or not. All they care is that they repeat that prayer so they can go away and brag about how they got a person to repeat a prayer. So what if a person repeats a prayer? You say, well, you're against prayer. No, I'm not against prayer. People can get saved when they pray, but they need to realize the prayer does not save them. What saves them is, as we'll see in a minute, faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, second... 1 Peter 2.24 We're going through this list here. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. So Christ bear our sins in his own body. That is, every sin that I ever did, he paid for on the cross. So that I don't have to go to hell and pay for myself. Now, if a person understands that, they can be saved. Sadly, with this little whittled down Romans road of one, two, three, or maybe four verses at the most, now repeat after me, oftentimes a sinner doesn't understand that. And they say, so how do I get saved? They say, well, you just say the prayer. Okay, well, let's say the old mystical prayer, and oh, magically I'm saved because I did something. Wait a minute, you did something with your mouth? Well, what about what Jesus did? You see, salvation is trusting what Jesus did. That soul winner just deceived you into thinking if you did something, then you'd be saved. You see the problem with the one, two, three, repeat after me method of supposedly winning souls to, to, to Jesus Christ? Now, there's some people that get saved in spite of that. But to instruct a person that the, the, the prayer saves is to deceive a person because prayer saves no one. What saves? Jesus and faith in him alone. I hope you can see that difference because a lot of so-called Christianity cannot see that. I wrote up here Hebrews 9.26 as well. It says, For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I like verse 28 there too. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Christ bore the sins. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, to be saved, you need to understand that. You need to realize, He paid for my sins, and I can only be saved through what He did for me. Sadly, many modern-day soul winners, soul wieners, don't care if there's a clear presentation of the gospel. All they care about is, one, two, three, repeat, repeat after me. Now, quickly, quickly, say this prayer, say this prayer. And then they walk away and say, ha, ha. I can brag on Sunday in church that I led someone to Jesus. You might have led them in a prayer, but did you really lead them to Jesus Christ? Or did you lead them down the wrong path into thinking, I'm saved by my prayer? If you really are a soul winner, then clear presentation of the gospel is what you're interested in. My dad used to win people to the Lord. And my dad wasn't very outgoing. He was kind of a hermit, really. He'd stay at home a lot and not get out much. But uh, whenever he could get somebody to the house here, and he'd get a chance, he would sit them down and he'd say, Look, are you a Christian? Are you saved? Do you know 100% beyond a shadow of doubt that you're on your way to heaven? 
If they say no, he'd say, wait right there. He'd go get his Bible. <clears throat> and I watched my dad over the years. He would take an hour, two hours, sometimes three hours, dealing with that person. And you could see him getting uncomfortable. You know, they're like, oh, man, how do I get out of this? But after the while, the more scriptures they looked at, I, I would see their face change. And they would just be like, huh. I never. And you could just see the understanding begin to come on that person. They begin to realize, wow, what you're showing me from the Bible is that Jesus died in my place for my sins and I'm only saved by Him. Because most of those people were lost, well, all of them were lost, and were trained since an early child, well, if you do good works, then you can be saved. And so they were beginning to understand and realize, man, my righteousness doesn't save me. It's the righteousness of Christ. And it seems like it took a long time. Because as I said earlier, it's like a deprogramming session. You had to go through and show them what they'd been taught was wrong before then you could go now and teach them what is right. So I have a hard time believing that these people that claim to be soul winners actually win souls to Jesus if they say, well, I did it real quick. There's a famous, famous, famous so-called preacher who's dead now, who if you, if, you knew, uh, if you knew him, I would mention his name, you would know him, but if you knew him, you would probably agree with me that he's one of the shallowest soul winners that ever lived. This man said that, and I've listened to his tapes, I've listened to this guy, and he said um, one time, he says, well, I went out and, and I told the Lord, this day I'm going to win eight people to the Lord today. So I was driving around town and going around, and all he did was just give one, two, three, four verses from the Romans Road and then tell a person, now repeat after me. And so was he making converts? No, he was making false converts that repeated a prayer. Some of them might have gotten saved in spite of what he was doing. But he said, and I listened to his tape, he says, well, I was driving home today and I was just crying with God, saying, God, I only got to lead seven people in prayer today. I didn't get eight people saved like I wanted. And he said, I was at a stoplight and I looked over. I said, hey man, do you believe in God? And the man says, yes. And he goes, praise God, I just want another soul to Jesus Christ. What a lie. You didn't, well, that sounds just like the old Muslim guy try to get somebody to repeat something and then say, oh, I proclaim you, you're one of us because you said it with the mouth. What about believing from the heart? This famous preacher, he missed that. He missed how important it is, the understanding from the heart. So when I lead someone to Jesus Christ, I want to make sure that I give a clear presentation of the gospel so clearly that they cannot miss that it is Jesus that saves them, not something that they do. I was in um, Guatemala. I was in Guatemala. And... Um, in Guatemala, I had an opportunity to uh, preach the gospel. And I preached in this church, and I preached hard on the blood of Jesus Christ. When I got done with that sermon, the pastor got up and said, Man, I, I want to confess to the church that, that I'm sorry. He said, All these years I've been given this shallow presentation of the gospel, trying to get people just to repeat a prayer. He said, What I want to do is I want to make salvation clear to sinners. And he said, I'm going to start preaching harder on the blood of Jesus Christ. When I got done preaching and, and that pastor uh, got done, someone came up to me after and said, Brother Breaker, there's a guy back here in the back that's just sitting there and he won't move. And we went up and talked to him. He says, I want to talk to that preacher, Breaker. and says, I want to get saved. So after that service, I got to go to the back of that church and sit down with that man. And you know what? I took about 20 minutes, 30 minutes just going through verse after verse after verse of Scripture with him. I said, now I have presented to you the gospel as plainly as I can, how that you're a sinner, but Jesus, as your sacrifice, died for your sins in your place. And then I showed him what I'm about to show you today about the shedding of blood and how salvation is by faith. I said, now what do you want to do? Are you ready to trust Jesus as your Savior? And he says, I am. I said, well, there's no greater thing that you could do they just simply go to God right now in prayer and tell Him, I trust you as my Savior. I said, I'm not going to tell you a prayer that you need to repeat because those would be my words, not yours. When I said that, I was going to say a couple more things. The guy just went, and he just started praying. And tears literally started pouring out of the guy's eyes. And I just sat there with my Bible and stared at the guy for about 10, 15 minutes. And then I'm just waiting. I'm saying, well, Lord, you're... You're dealing with this man's heart. There's no doubt about that. Well, I'm just going to sit here and wait. And then after that, the guy went, All right. He said, I know that I'm saved now.
because I trust Christ as my Savior. I just went, woo! <laughs> now, I could have real quickly said, oh, you want to get saved? Just repeat after me. But there would be no way if I knew that that guy truly understood the gospel. And I couldn't sleep at night. That's why I wanted to take the time to take him through the verses so that the Holy Spirit of God could work on his heart. And you know what? There was no doubt that he understood. And I can say, I, I believe he trusted in Jesus from the heart. From the heart. Well, there's so many other verses I have to go to. I, I can't even go to them all. I barely have time. Hebrews 9, 12, 22. This is about shedding of blood. When I try to lead a soul to Jesus Christ, I always try to take them to the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. God shed his blood for your sins. Ephesians 1, 7. Colossians 1, 4 and 14. I tell them, the Bible says that the forgiveness of sins is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I give them these other verses, how redemption, uh, 1 Peter 1, 18, you're not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. I show them about the blood of Jesus. How important is that? So, <clears throat> I'm not going to have time to give all these verses today. But then I show them about salvation by faith. And what I did is I take them to verses like uh, this one. Acts 16, 30, and 31. Um, I take them to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Now I realize I'm mostly speaking to Christians today about how to win souls to Jesus Christ, but it might be that you're watching this and you're not saved. I would encourage you to read these verses. So then I take them after I show them the gospel plainly, as clear as a bell, I give the gospel. And after I do that, I show them now it's all the blood that forgives. And then I show them now the way to be saved is by faith, trusting in what Jesus did. Acts 16, 30, 31. Sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? The man says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They should see that salvation is a free gift. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith. It's not works and it's not the law that saves, it's faith alone. Well then the question is, faith in what? Romans 3.25 says, faith in the blood. If you get a chance, go to my testimony. My testimony is I was saved on Romans 3.25. Because I had a dad that loved me enough to sit me down and take me through the Bible and give me a clear presentation of the gospel. It might have taken 20, 30, 40 minutes, I don't remember. But my dad went through, and you can see on my, on my video about my testimony, the things that my dad showed me from the Bible. And I understood for the first time in my life. Because I thought, oh, i got to do all these things to be saved. And he showed me from the scriptures, it's not what I do. It's simply trusting in what Jesus did. And that's when I trusted the blood atonement of Christ. And that's when I got saved. When a person gets saved, <clears throat> well, then it's good to take them through and show them that once you're saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 4.30. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22. Sometimes it's not enough just to tell somebody how to get saved and they get saved. You need to tell them, now that you're saved, here's what happens. You're a new creature in Christ. You've been born again. You need to live right and do right and, and serve God and go tell others about it and tell them your testimony. So, trust the blood. Now, where in the Romans road does it say, trust the blood? It's not there. Where is the gospel in the Romans road? Well, it mentions part of the gospel, but why settle on just giving them part of the gospel? If you really want to win a soul, why not take them to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, give them the whole gospel? Now, when a person's saved, they need to realize that they're a son of God. 1 Peter 1.23, Galatians 3.26. So, getting a soul saved is, is just taking a person through the scriptures and showing them what God says about it. And that's what's so important. Now let me close with this. Many today have been taught the way to win a soul to Jesus is the Romans road. Just four little verses. Now repeat this prayer after me. And when they go to the Romans road, they always go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, and that's where they end up. 
And they use that verse and they say, well, call means with the mouth, so if you'll just call with your mouth, then you'll be saved. And that's what they tell someone is, if you just pray the prayer with your mouth, you're saved. Well, what I've tried to do is show you from the Bible today, that's not enough. Just saying something with your lips does not save you. What saves you is whether or not you believe from the heart. And there are many well-meaning soul winners out there today that are leading people to hell rather than salvation through Jesus Christ by deceiving them into thinking that calling is just by the mouth. And that if you just say from your mouth, Oh God, please save me, you'll go to heaven. Well, that's true. Every lost carpenter on the top of a roof that's ever hit his thumb with a hammer and said, Oh, Jesus, just got saved because he called on the name of the Lord. Is that right? Let's read the context of Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> because I don't want to deceive people into thinking they're saved when they're not. In modern Christianity today, just like those Muslims, counts a conversion by if you just say from your mouth then they'll accept it. But God's not looking at the mouth, He's looking at the heart. Whether you believe from the heart. So Romans chapter 10, verse 13 even shows this. Look at verse, verse 9. And shalt believe in thy heart. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's not just repeating something with the mouth. It's whether or not you trust from the heart. And the way you trust from the heart is to understand. When you truly understand what Jesus has done for you, then the tears come. Not always. I didn't cry when I got saved, but I tell you what, I felt bad realizing this is what saves me. You mean, he did all that for me? That tears you up. Now look what it says in verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they say, see, I just gave you three verses. You're a sinner. Jesus died in your place. Now call on the Lord and you're saved. Boom, boom, boom. Oh Lord, I'm a sinner. Please save me. Amen. You're saved. See you later. That's what most so-called Christians do today. And that person sits there going, Well, he said I'm saved, so I must be. All right, I'm going to the bar and get drunk. <laughs> Where's the understanding? Where's the preaching of the gospel? What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, let's go to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse 22. You see, a lot of people take one word and rest it to their own destruction. A lot of people think, that the word call means just from the lips, and that's not what it means. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. Sure, you can call with the mouth, sure. But until you call from the heart, you're not saved. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Modern Christianity today that puts all the emphasis on soul winning, it's all for not unless you put the emphasis on believing from the heart. You see, when you go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, that calling is calling upon God from your heart to be saved. That's, I want to be saved. And I want it so bad that I trust the free gift that God offers. Some people don't understand. You go, you give them a couple verses now and repeat after me. If that person doesn't understand, they call from the mouth only. And the rest of their life, they're lost thinking they're a Christian because they repeated the prayer. But the prayer doesn't save you. It's whether or not you believe and trust from the heart. I'm going to prove that from you uh, to you right now, Romans chapter 10. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's where they stop. What's the rest of it say? How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they may not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. This is what you're supposed to preach. I'm sorry, the Romans road, one, two, three verses, now repeat after me, does not present clearly the gospel of salvation. That's the problem. You must preach the gospel. 16, for they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? See the emphasis of salvation by believing from the heart. Not just saying something, repeating something with the mouth. It says in verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why it's so important to give as many verses as possible 
and try to lead that person to an understanding in Christ. You're not trying to lead them to repeat a prayer. You're trying to lead them to an understanding from the heart to where they can call upon God from the heart and trust Him by faith. So we have a lot of people out there today in churches that claim to be soul winners that totally, totally misunderstand what it is to lead a soul to Jesus Christ. It's not to get that person to repeat his prayer as soon as possible. It's to get that person to understand what Jesus did for them so that their faith is in the blood of Jesus Christ. So their faith is in the gospel. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I've got to read it. Got to read it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, by which also you have received and wherein you stand. By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Why do you go through four verses in a Roman's road and then tell a person to repeat after you? Why not just go to those four verses and say, here's the gospel, here's what Jesus did for you. You're a sinner. He died for your sins as your sacrifice. He shed His blood. When He was on the cross, He shed His blood without the shedding of blood. Guess what? You can be saved by faith in the gospel. Ephesians 1.13 says, after you heard the gospel of truth, after you trusted the gospel, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. See, a lot of people that just preach, one, two, three, pray after me, they're leaving out the gospel. They're leaving out a clear presentation of what Jesus did. Now, I'm not against the Romans Road. If you want to use the Romans Road, help yourself. But I think the Romans Road is more than just three or four verses. If you're going to use the Romans Road and only use verses from Romans, why don't you end up on Romans 3.25, stressing the importance of trusting the blood atonement? <clears throat> why do you make repeating something the way of salvation? When salvation is by repenting. What does that mean? That means from turning to trusting what Jesus did. Turning from trusting in yourself and your own righteousness to trusting Christ's righteousness. If you want to be a soul winner, why not be a true soul winner? If you want to win souls to Jesus, why not do it the right way? Guide them. Lead them to an understanding of the gospel so that they can trust the gospel and be saved. Because all too often... And I've seen it in my ministry. It happened to me. It happened to my wife. Many people have contacted us and say, You're right. All I ever heard was just repeat the sinner's prayer. And I did that every day of my life. And I wasn't saved. Until one day I understood the gospel and believed that and was saved. So it could be that you're watching this and you claim to be a Christian. And yet you're lost. When I get saved today, trust the gospel. This is what the Bible says on how to be saved. It could be that you're a Christian, but you're just using this method that your church taught you on how to go win souls. Well, why don't you use the Bible to go win souls and to point people to a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I don't know what else to say. I've tried to lay it all out there as best I can, how to be saved, how to lead a soul to Jesus Christ. And it's hard nowadays. We're in the last days. A lot of people, they don't understand Many of them are deceived by a false religion, so it's like I said earlier, it's a deprogramming session. You have to show them in the Bible where they're wrong before they'll even listen to this to be true. Some of the hardest people in the world to reach are those people that think, well, no, I'm saved by works and I have to keep the law to be saved. No, you don't. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Jesus Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. It's not the works of the law that saves us. It's faith in Jesus Christ. So this is how to lead a soul to Jesus Christ. I hope this has been edifying. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I don't want to attack people that want to go out and win souls. But I do want to say this. Why don't you do it correctly? When you do it right, then God deals with their heart. But when you do it wrong, all you're doing is just going out and trying to get someone to repeat after you. And that's a problem. We need to trust in Jesus Christ by faith alone in the gospel. We're not out there trying to get people to repeat after us. We're no better than the Muslims who just try to get people to repeat what they say. Oh, it's God, they say. But you could say that but not believe it. I don't believe that. Well, Jesus died for my sins. You could say that with your mouth and not believe it. Well, I do believe it. But I've come across many people who claim to be Christians that are playing church, sitting in church, pretending to be a Christian. People say, are you saying, oh yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is God and He died on the cross for the sins of the world. 
and you say, well, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Oh, my church attendance, my baptism, what I do. So they know the right words to say with their mouth, but what are they trusting in from the heart? Because it's what you believe from the heart that saves you. Calling on God for salvation is by faith in the gospel, in the blood of Christ from the heart. So I hope this will help you. Um, what I did is I wrote these verses here in my Bible. Because sometimes it's hard to remember which verse to take someone to. So if you come across somebody and you have your Bible and you're talking to them, they go, well, you know, I don't want to go to hell. How do I get to heaven? You go, ah, let me show you some verses. <laughs> and you have a list of verses that you can use. And what you're trying to do is show them those verses so that person understands and believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you so, for watching. I hope this has been uh, uh, something that will help you as a Christian. Time is short. I truly believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. And what we need to do is we need to win souls to Jesus. And the way to do that is to show them the verses in the hope that God will deal upon their hearts and they'll trust Christ. Sure they can pray. Sure they can pray. But they need, you need to make sure that if they pray, it's their words, not yours. Why would they need to repeat what you say? If they fully understand the gospel, shouldn't they go to God in their own words and say, Lord, I, I understand now and I trust what you've done for me. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next week here on the Cloud Church. And I hope you go out and win somebody to the Lord. And if you do, let me know. It'd be awesome to hear from people who say, Brother Breaker, I got those verses. I wrote them down. I went out and I got to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. That would be awesome. We rejoice with you. And it's a wonderful thing to see somebody get saved. See you next time.